Well, praise the Lord, everybody. It is good for us to be here, and we are so glad to be back with you for our Wednesday night Bible study, and we hope that you are as excited to be back as we are. <laughs> Amen. And so we are, we are grateful uh, to be back. And so as we always do each week, we do ask that you help us to expand our digital footprint, and how you do that is by liking, sharing, and subscribing uh, to all of our social media platforms. Uh, that certainly helps us to reach more people, gives us an opportunity uh, to touch even some of the people that you know that we may not know. So if you'll be sure to like, share, and subscribe to all of our social media platforms, that will help us again to reach uh, more people. And so we appreciate you sharing your sphere of influence with us. Second thing we ask you to do is continue to remember all of our sick and shut-in members in prayer, particularly those who are bereaved. And so we ask you to continue to lift those names uh, in prayer. Uh, particularly, we want to pray for Sister uh, Carolyn Perry and Sister Lisa Mullen, who lost their brother in Texas. And, of course, Trustee uh, Cleveland and uh, Reverend Connie Phillips, who lost... Uh, one of their relatives as well. And so we want to continue to lift those families uh, in prayer, as well as all who may be bereaved that we may not know about and those who may be uh, sick that we do not know about. So we do ask you to uh, remember those in prayer. And always pray for one another. Always continue to pray for your church. Uh, always continue to do that. And uh, we certainly will appreciate you doing that. And then the last thing we ask you to do is Make this time as interactive as possible uh, by asking whatever questions that you may have concerning the subject matter that we're talking about. Uh, for those of you who are in person, if you would jot it down and give it to a member of our team in the back, if we have opportunity at the end of our time together, then we will answer those questions. And for those of you who are watching in our Calvary Everywhere space, uh, if you will simply put it in the chat uh, and then we will uh, try to get to those as well and answer those questions. And so we appreciate you continuing to make this time interactive. Thank those of you who shared some Bible study topics uh, for this year. We're continuing to um, pray over some of those, um, but we're going to start in a particular place uh, on tonight, and then we will just kind of make our way uh, through the rest of the year. So we're excited about what God will do in this 2024 year. Uh, we're grateful for this time of alignment that he's given us uh, to be better. He's given us an opportunity to be better, to do better. And uh, hopefully uh, we will all take advantage of that opportunity uh, because we all can stand a little bit of improvement. Amen. <laughs> and so we certainly uh, hope that we will all take advantage of the opportunity to be um, not just better people, but to be better Christians. Um, and to just manage our life uh, in, in better ways. Uh, love people. Uh, treat people right. Uh, be a godly example uh, to the people that we come in contact with. Just because people are not godly with you does not mean you don't need to be godly with them. And so we want to, we want to focus this year on being better ourselves, not focusing on what other people are doing but focusing on what we're doing. And I think that's really important because you can't control what other people do, but you can control what you do. And so it is really good for us to be managing ourselves well and taking advantage of the opportunity uh, that we have to be better. So we're going to jump into our lesson tonight. Of course, whenever we start any Bible study lesson, it's always a little dense. And so we ask that you kind of uh, stay awake through the dense part, and then we get through the we get to the meaty part. But we do ask you to do that because I like to give I like to give foundation uh, before we actually start to unpack uh, what it is that we're going to talk about. All right, so we're going to do that tonight. So stay awake. Make sure you keep your neighbor awake. Uh, make them accountable, and then we will navigate through our time together and through our lesson on tonight. So tonight we're going to start a new, we're going to start a new uh, lesson and we're going to go to 
uh, the book of Revelations, and we're going to navigate through some of this. I'm, I, I started this um, with the intention of going uh, through the book of Revelations, and then I got stuck in the first three chapters of Revelations, and so that's kind of where we'll spend the next couple of weeks in there, but we're going to look at these seven churches uh, that the book of Revelations opens with. So uh, you can already, if you have your Bibles, you can already go on to Revelations chapter, Revelation chapter 1, and uh, we're going to get through uh, some of this introductory material on tonight. So uh, as, we, as we prepare to navigate our way through 2024, uh, our emphasis is on divine alignment. That is our declaration for this year of 2024. I want us to look at some of the things that can cause misalignment, okay? I want us to look at some of the things that can cause misalignment. Since we're talking about alignment, I want to look at some things that can cause misalignment uh, and how we can correct some of those things. Uh, as always, uh, whenever I'm going into a new series, I like to make a few disclaimers, and so I want to do that uh, tonight as well. I want to begin our time together by making a couple of disclaimers. I also want to give you some functional definitions for some terms that we will use as we go through the lesson. So as you continue to hear them, uh, you will know the perspective from which we're coming and which we're dealing with. And so... Uh, the first one, the first two disclaimers that I want to deal with uh, real briefly tonight, the beginning of my time together, because it's very important that we get these disclaimers down so that we don't go into this lesson uh, with any uh, preconceived notions uh, that might lead us in the wrong direction, okay? So the two disclaimers that I want to give you, first of all, as we go into this lesson, is number one, there is no such thing as a perfect church. Okay? That's, the first, that's the first one that I want to give you. There is no such thing as a perfect church. Every, every church you go to will have its issues. Okay? You're not going to go into any church and there not be some issues. Not all churches have the same issue. But guess what? All churches have issues. Okay? So I need for you to, that's the first thing I need you to understand. And I'll unpack some of this a little bit as we go along. Second thing I want you to understand is I want us, as we go through this lesson, to understand the term spirit, to understand the term spirit. And the reason I want you to do that is because much of what we discuss over the course of the next couple of weeks uh, will be from the perspective of spirit, Okay. It'll be from the perspective of spirit, and I need you to know. Um, I need you to know how we're dealing and how we're using the word, because it makes a difference as to how you understand and you unpack what we're trying to unpack. So, two things I want you to um, go into the lesson understanding. Number one, that there are no perfect churches. Number two, uh, I want us to make sure that we have a proper understanding of the word spirit. Let me briefly deal with the first disclaimer. Uh, there are no perfect churches. There are no perfect churches. As we go through the lesson, I don't want anyone to be under the impression that if we correct some things uh, that we're going to discuss, that it means that if you correct those things, then you're going to have a perfect and trouble-free congregation. That's the first thing I want you to understand. Because sometimes people have this impression that if you give me all of these things that cause misalignment, if I correct all of the misalignment, then I've shifted uh, to a perfect congregation. That's not true. If you fix everything that we talk about in this particular part of the series, that you're going to end up with a perfect church, guess what? You are sadly mistaken. And the reason you're mistaken is because the church the church visible. There are two terms that you will hear sometimes. You'll hear church visible and church invisible. When we talk about church invisible, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about um, uh, the church that Jesus established when he says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell. Well, he wasn't talking about a local church. 
he, he wasn't talking about the local church down the street. That, that's not what he was talking about. He was talking about church from a global perspective, okay? And so um, when we talk about the imperfections of church, I need for us to understand, if we fix everything that we talk about in this lesson, you're still going to have an imperfect church. The reason you're going to have an imperfect church, guess, guess why? Is because everybody in it is imperfect. Okay? So, so, so that's one of the reasons that there are no perfect churches, because churches are made up of people. And people are, there you go, people are imperfect. And so, and, and I need to say that to some people who have issues with the church, because there are some people who have, who have major issues with the church. Let's be honest, we don't always get it right. And I need somebody to help me right there. We, we, we don't always get it right. Some, sometimes we miss the mark. Sometimes we miss the mark, and, and, and people will, will walk away from a church holding that against us. Uh, well, you, your job ain't perfect, but you keep going back there. Okay, y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. You, 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 you go to the grocery store, and sometimes they out of what you want, but you keep going back there. Them Amazon deliveries continuously showing up on the doorstep. Even when they late. Come, come on, y'all. Y'all understand. But you keep on ordering. So, so why is it that when you experience the imperfection in church, now you're ready to quit? When you don't quit nothing else because of its imperfections. And so I need for you to understand that that is, that is something that we need to keep in mind. Um, there are two reasons why the church is not perfect. Uh, I've talked about one being our humanity, but the first one, uh, the other one that I want to tell you is one of the reasons the church is not perfect is because we deal with the adversary. We deal with the adversary, the devil. And y'all do know the devil go to church too, right? Oh, come on, y'all. I need you. I, I got Bible on that. I actually got Bible on that. But, 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 but the devil go to church too. He go to church just like you come and sit up in here. Uh, he come sit up in here too. And sometimes he show up and he got to go to overflow. But that's okay. But he show. He, but, but he comes. He, he, he don't mind going to overflow. Okay. So, so sometimes that happens. Sometimes he does mind. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other story. Uh, and so we do have to deal with uh, our adversary, the devil. Our adversary, the devil, I need you to hear me on, on, on these introductory comments because it'll make sense as we go through the lesson. Our adversary will always, somebody say always. always. Our adversary will always find ways to infiltrate our fellowship. Watch this, don't miss this, and find a host. I'm going to go slow. Go slow because I don't want you to miss this. Our adversary will always find ways to infiltrate our fellowship and find a host to knowingly or unknowingly advocate on his behalf. One more time. Our adversary will always find ways to infiltrate our fellowship and find a host to knowingly or unknowingly advocate on his behalf. Some people are used by the devil and don't know they've been used. Mm. Mm. That, that, because here's the thing you got to understand. Here, here's, here's one of the areas you got to understand. See, there's a difference between constructive criticism and intentional efforts to divide. Y'all got me? There, there, there's a difference. And so we have to be discerning enough to know the difference between when criticism is constructive and when it's planting seeds of division. Okay, because your, your end result are not the same. They're not the same. Secondly, I want to talk real quickly about uh, spirits, this term spirits. Now, and I really need you to get this because it's going to help you to navigate and understand the whole lesson. When we talk about spirit, small s, not spirit, capital S, because usually when we see spirit capitalized, we're referring to the spirit of God or Holy Spirit. So I'm talking spirit, small s. When we talk about spirits, we're not necessarily talking about something ghostly or something mystical, okay? We're not talking about ghosts like Casper. We're not talking about 
uh, stuff levitating through the, you know, that, not that kind of stuff. We, 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 when we talk, we're not talking about something ghostly or something mystical. The term spirit is basically used in two ways, especially in the context of theology or in the context of church. The term spirit is basically used two ways. Number one, it is used to refer to the non-physical part of a person that houses their emotions and their character. The part of you that is non-physical, that houses your emotions and houses your character, is your spirit. That's your spirit. That, that's your, 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 your spirit is the part of you that causes you to be the way you are. Okay? That's important because it houses your emotions and your character. That's the spirit of a person. The part of you that houses your emotions and your character. The spirit of a person includes the intellect, the emotions, the fears, the passions, and the creativity of an individual, okay? <clears throat> it is the part of us, the, the spirit of a person is the part of us that is akin to God, okay? Well, you say, well, wait a minute, Bishop, hold up. You, you kind of confused me a little bit. It, it, it's, it's akin to God. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'll explain that to you in just a few minutes. Um, but the spirit of a person, the word spirit comes from the word pneuma. Uh, you've heard the term pneumatology. If you've had any kind of uh, theological background, it comes from the word pneuma, and it means breath. That's what, that's what the term pneuma means. Uh, it means breath. The, the breath, breathing. Remember, God does what? He breathes into man, okay? In Job chapter 32, verse 28, here's what we read. But it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand, okay? So it is the part of us that is akin to God. It is the part of us that is akin to uh, to God. It is the part of us that makes us, when it's operating like it's supposed to, it is the part of us that makes us most like God. Okay? Not, not that it makes us God, not that it makes us, and I've even heard some people teach it that we are God's little G. Well, I, I ain't kind of with that, okay? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not with that. But it is the part of us that makes us most like God. Okay? Now, when God created man, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, when God creates man in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that's what we are told. We are told, then the Lord God, watch it carefully, formed man of dust from the ground. And what did he do next? He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And what happens to this pile of dirt? It becomes a living soul. It becomes a living soul. So the breath that God deposits into us is his spirit, okay? And this passage tells us that the breath or the spirit that God breathed into man is what causes him to become a living soul. So when a person dies, guess what happens to the spirit? The spirit has exited the body. Y'all with me? Because it is the spirit that gives life to the body. So once the spirit has exited the body, you now have this thing called death. Death is the cessation of life. That means there's no longer life in that physical structure because the thing that makes it living is no longer there. It has exited. Okay? And so and, and I know somebody is probably wondering, well, you know, if, if the spirit in the man is, is akin to God, like God, um, then why are people so evil? I, I know, I know you probably, that thought probably comes across your mind because you got to remember now, you got to remember when you go back through the creation story, what happens to man? He falls. Are, are y'all with me? What, what happens to man when, when, when man falls? When he falls, 
uh, there, is a, there is a contamination, if you will. There is a polluting of that spirit. Yeah, yeah, with me? So, so the, spirit, the spirit that God put in the man, it was good when he put it in there. Ah, but because of the decisions and the choices that we make, that goodness is contaminated. And so out of that, you start getting all kinds of things, narcissism, uh, uh, pride. You, you get a whole host of things once you, start to put, once you start to pollute that. And so the second part of when we talk about spirit is not just the spirit of, of a person, not just the spirit of a person, but there's also the spirit of a thing. Okay? You have the spirit of a person, which is the intellect. The emotions, all of that, that's what the character of a person, that, that's the spirit of a person. But you also have, when you use the term spirit, you also have the spirit of a thing. Uh, that refers to things like intention or approach. Am I making sense? It, it suggests that an action or a decision is guided by a particular set of principles or, or the character of a particular idea or group or person, okay? That's the spirit of a thing. For example, for example, if we say, uh, let's do this in the spirit of productivity, okay? What we're suggesting is the focus of the action should be centered around the efficiency and the benefit of the thing. That's the spirit of a thing, okay? The spirit of a thing uh, speaks to the intentionality of a particular action. It speaks to the intentionality of a particular action. And so, we have two things we have to understand before we go into this lesson. We, can talk, we talk about the spirit, of, the spirit of man or the spirit of a person, which is their character, their emotions, their intellect. Uh, what causes them to be who they are, the thing that gives them life. That's the spirit of a person. But then you have the spirit of a thing that speaks to motive. It speaks to intentionality. It speaks to that sort of thing. So I need you to keep those two things in mind. I need you to keep those two things in mind, the spirit of a person and the spirit of a thing. Spirit of a person uh, is all those things I just previously mentioned. Spirit of a thing speaks to the intentionality, a motive, approach. So what does all of that have to do uh, with, this, with this lesson? What does that have to do with this lesson? It is important that we go into this series to understand the difference between spirit as it relates to one's character and spirit as it relates to the intentionality of a thing. Because if you, if you don't understand that, then you're not going to understand the lesson, okay? You, you're not going to understand the lesson if you don't understand and able to di differentiate between the spirit of a person and the spirit of a thing. Uh, that's important. Spirit as it relates to character, spirit as it relates to intention. One refers to who a person is. The other refers to why somebody acts in a particular manner. Okay? One refers to who a person is. I need you to get this. One refers to who a person is. The other refers to motive, intention. Now, why is that important to understand that? I told you, this is a dense part. Y'all got to hang in here with me. It's important to understand that the why, and I need y'all to get this part, the why may not always be an accurate depiction of the who. Are, are y'all here? Y'all got to get this. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the why is not an actual depiction of the who. But... Here's the other part of that. The who directly influences the why. Have I got any help in the room? Y'all here? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Make sure, you, make sure you're with me. It's important to understand. The why may not always be an accurate depiction of the who, but the who 
directly influences the why. Let me give you an example for clarification. Uh, here's, here's an example that I'm sure we can all understand. Um, the fact that a person told a lie does not make them a pathological liar. Come on, y'all hear? It, it, was an, it was an action that a person thought best to take in that moment for a greater purpose. Y'all hear? Y'all got to talk. To, I'm a preacher. Y'all got to talk to me, okay? <laughs> it, it, the, the fact that a person told a lie does not necessarily mean they are a liar. It was an action that a person thought best to take in that moment for a greater purpose. I give you, a, I give you an extreme example. Uh, if the police comes, if, 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 if we lived in a communist country and the police come to your house and they start asking for people in your house and these are people that are relatives that you love, they're family members and they ask you, are they here? You might be inclined to say what? <laughs> no. Did you lie? Yeah. Come on, y'all. <laughs> but you, but 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 your your lie took into account the greater purpose. The fact that you said, "No, they're not here," when you know they're here, they they right up in the attic. <laughs> okay, but 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 you. So so does that make you a liar? No, it doesn't. That's not, that, no, it doesn't. But then you got the other hand, the other side. When a person has been found to be a liar, then everything that comes out of that person requires a level of review. Because it's been deemed that the words of that person cannot be trusted. Now, that's a, that's a liar. Come on. When, when, when you have to check everything they say, because they have a history or a pattern of not telling the truth, okay? That, that's a whole different thing than the person who lied and said they didn't, wasn't nobody in the attic and they were up there and they were trying to save a life, okay? So, so you have to understand, let me go back to my statement, you have to understand that the why may not always be an ag adequate um, an accurate depiction of the who, but the who directly influences the why. Got me? Okay, so, so, now that we, now that we kind of hopefully understand uh, those disclaimers, and those disclaimers, again, are understanding there are no perfect churches because we always have to deal with our humanity. We always have to deal with the adversary. And then we understand spirit, spirit of a person, Spirit of a thing. We have to understand that distinction as well. So hopefully that we understand those disclaimers, and, and we may come up with some, some others as we go through the series. Let's go to the book of Revelation. Now I need now now I, I get the I get the privilege of pastoring a smart church. Okay? I get to, y'all should have said something, somebody should have said. Yeah, I get, to, <laughs> I get the privilege of pastoring an intelligent church. And, and so we go into the book of Revelation. The word Revelation is actually singular and not plural, mm. as most people pronounce the book. Sometimes people say, oh, turn to the book of Revelations. No, that's not right. That's incorrect. The word Revelation is singular, not plural. And that's for a reason, because... The book of Revelation is the singular last message of Jesus Christ to the church before he comes back again. There is a unity of, it's not several messages, it's one. It's one. That's why the word Revelation is singular, not plural. So it's not the book of Revelations, it's the book of Revelation, okay? So when y'all say when y'all say that y'all y'all will know better, right? Okay, okay, all right, all right. You know it, it's like it's like a sermon with multiple points. All those points support what the main point or the main topic. Now I know some people do preach four or five sermons at one time, but that's 
not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about one thing. So our focus is going to be on Revelations, Revelation chapter 1, some bad habits. You got to break it. Got to break that habit. Our focus is going to be on Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, through Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. Our time together tonight doesn't give us, afford us the opportunity to read all of that. So that's kind of your homework, okay? To read Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, through Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. That gives you the context, if you will, of our lesson as we go through here. So let me give you a little bit of background. Let me give you a little historical context. Um, because if you don't understand what was happening then, it's hard uh, to interpret even how it applies today. Okay? Again, I get to pastor an intelligent church, so when we read the Bible, we know how to read it. We don't just pull out scriptures and start interpreting them without the benefit of the context in which they're in because we know that that's not the proper way uh, to teach and interpret scripture, okay? I, I use this as an example all the time. When Paul tells Timothy, you know, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake, then everybody go around talking about, well, the Bible said I can have some wine, but he wasn't talking to you, <laughs> okay? He wasn't, he wasn't talking to you. He was talking to Timothy. Context matters. Come on, y'all. Con context matters. Some things, some things he says, okay, here's another one. When, when the Bible says women be silent in church, he wasn't talking to y'all. That, that was a cultural conversation for that time. That was not a universal truth, okay? So, so it, was not a, it was not a universal truth in the sense that everybody needs to do that for all time. There was a reason Paul says that. I, I'm not teaching that, but there's a reason that Paul says that at that time, and it was referring to that time. You, so you got some people who are saying, no, the Bible says women need to be silent in church. That's even today. No, that's not true. First of all, if all the women be quiet, we're going to have a real quiet church. But you know what I'm saying? But, but you know, that, that, that's, something, that, that, that's something else. But there's, a, there's, a, there's, another, there's other reasons behind that that doesn't play into our lesson. So... Let me give you a little bit of background that's going to kind of guide our conversation. Um, Rome at this time, at the time of the text, has become increasingly hostile to Christians after Jesus' death. Tradition tells us that every disciple, every disciple, this is how you know how hostile Rome is to the church at that time. Every disciple except one is violently killed. Come on, y'all. I need some. This is historical context, historical background. Every disciple was violently killed. We call that martyrdom. They were martyred. Uh, every disciple was violently killed except one. And that's John. And this is the same John who writes the book of Revelation, and also the same John who writes the gospel according to St. John. He's the only one that, is, that does not experience a violent death. All of the other disciples experience violent death. Uh, Andrew, who is the brother of Peter, is crucified on an X-shaped cross. Uh, Bartholomew, which you will also hear referred to as Nathaniel, uh, was skinned alive and then crucified. James the Greater, who is the son of Zebedee, but also the brother of John, was beheaded. James the Lesser was stoned to death. Jude, who you will refer to sometimes as Thaddeus, is both stoned and crucified. Judas Iscariot, when you go to the next one, Judas Iscariot, we know, did what? Commit suicide. We know how he died. Matthew, who you will sometimes uh, hear referred to as Levi, uh, is stabbed to death. Peter, we know how he died. He was what? Crucified what? Upside down. Because he said he was not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. So he asked him that if you're going to crucify me, 
that you will turn me upside down. Philip was crucified. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Thomas was stabbed to death. Matthias, who was Judas's replacement that gets elected as the next disciple in the book of Acts, he ends up being stoned to death. And then, of course, Paul, who some scholars refer to as the 13th disciple, uh, was beheaded uh, by Nero. So you see what I'm saying? Rome is hostile to Christianity. All of the disciples, except one, die this violent death. Now, this is interesting because when, when we go to the next one, when, when, they, when they tried to kill John, John is, John is the beloved disciple. He's the, he's the disciple that the Bible says, this is the disciple, this is the disciple that Jesus loved. You hear that referred to uh, in scripture. Uh, interesting enough, they tried to kill John by boiling him in oil. They, 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 they heated up a cauldron of oil and they put him over in there and it boiled. And when they went to get him out, he just stepped out and had no injuries. Isn't that something? <laughs> and so they tried to kill him, and when they couldn't kill him, they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, which is where the book of Revelation is written. So when, when they couldn't kill him, they just put him on an island and left him there. And, and interestingly enough, he lives to be about 100 years old, and then he dies of natural causes. So John is the only one who dies of natural causes. All of the other disciples are violently killed. They're violently murdered. So as John is on the island of Patmos, and he's about to, and he's given the inspiration to write the book of Revelation, John is instructed as you go through this lesson uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, all the way, chapter 3, verse 22. John is instructed to write seven letters to seven churches in Asia, which is now modern-day Turkey. Okay? A uh, Asia, at that time, is now today modern-day Turkey. As a matter of fact, they do say that even some of the ruins of these seven churches still exist. They're still there. You can actually go to Turkey right now, and it takes you about three days to visit all seven of the sites of these seven churches in Asia. In Asia. These are literal churches. These are actual churches in first century. These seven churches. So what are the seven churches? The seven churches... In Asia are the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, not Smyrna, Delaware, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay? Those are the seven churches that John is directed to write seven letters to these seven churches that are there. Now, this is interesting because when you read the text, come on, y'all, when you read the text, when Christ appears to John, when Christ appears to John on the Isle of Patmos, when he appears to John, John sees seven candlesticks, okay? Each, the candles, each candlestick represents one of these churches. Y'all with me? So he sees seven candlesticks. This is interesting. And right in the middle of these seven candlesticks that he sees, there is one, he says, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, there is one, he says, where he sees Jesus. Y'all hear? So, so Jesus is standing in the midst of these seven churches that are symbolized 
by candlesticks. Now, this is important. This is, this is good, y'all. This is, this is important. Let me, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why this is important. This is where we kind of get the description of Jesus. Okay? Hair like lamb's wool. Come, come on. Uh, feet like polished brass. Now, does that sound like a Caucasian man to you? Okay, I didn't think so. Okay. So, um, seven candlesticks. Seven candlesticks. That, there's a whole story behind the reason you get a, a white Jesus, but that's no another story. Um, you, got, you got seven, I ain't got time to teach that either. You got seven candlesticks, and Jesus is standing in the middle of these candlesticks. Y'all, this is good. That, that's important because what the imagery suggests, watch this, is none of these candlesticks created their own light. Oh, Jesus, I need you to catch what I'm saying. None of them created, their light came from the light of Christ. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. So you got, you got seven, seven candlesticks that has light on it, but none of them created their own light. Their light came from the light of Christ. That, that's important for you to know. That's important for you to know. Because, see, see, you, you got to be careful uh, that we're not running around here acting like our light is our light. Lord Jesus. The Bible says, let your light shine. Watch this. That men will do what? See your good works, but do what? Glorify the Father in heaven. The reason for that is the light that you let shine ain't really your light. Mm. It's his light. It's the light that he's given to you. It's the light. It's like, it's like you, you, you know, when we had the, um, the grief share program and, and, and people lit theirs off of somebody else's. Y'all remember how, how, how we did that? So that means no one person was the possessor of the light. They had to get the light from somewhere. Lord Jesus, behold, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Man didn't do that for himself. It was by the shedding of blood that we have the remission of sin. So whatever light we have is not ours. It's the light of Christ that we are reflecting. So that's, that's important imagery because you need to understand. None of, us have a, none of us are the owner of the light. The light we have is a light, Lord help me, ha, that has been given to us by Christ. Now, here's the other part you got to understand. Christ is in the middle of these seven candlesticks. Uh, that represent these seven churches of Asia. But here's the part you got to get. Don't miss this. Anywhere Christ is, you can expect an attempt of the devil to infiltrate. Amen. Lord, help me here. Let me try it one more time. Anywhere Christ is, you can expect an attempt of the devil to infiltrate. Now, we know that to be true. Hey, y'all read, read the book of Job, right? Well, we know two times in the book of Job. Job chapter 1, verse number 6. Job chapter 2, verse number 1, where Satan presents himself to the Lord. Y'all need to read the Bible. Come on. Our, our, our current subject matter won't allow us to get into a discussion on the meaning of those passages, but suffice it to say that, don't miss this, there are entities whose assign, their assignment, is to watch over human activity with the purpose of searching out our weaknesses and attempting to disqualify us for divine favor, grace, and mercy. Okay, y'all not hear what I'm saying. You got to understand. You got to understand. Just like you got an angel assigned to you, you got a demon assigned to you. Y'all not hear what I'm saying. And what the demon is designed to do is to search out your weaknesses so that he can then go to God and try to disqualify you from divine mercy, great Lord, and favor. That's why you will hear the devil referred to as the accuser of the brethren. His job 
is to find your weakness and then go back to God and show God as if God don't know. Show God and then say to God, this is the reason you can't use them. Lord, I wish I had a church. I wish I had somebody. See, see, people who understand grace, mercy, and favor will shout out for that. Because it means that the fact that God can use me really has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with God giving me something that I don't have within myself. So when the devil, God help me, when the devil goes to God and say you can't use them, God is saying you right. Oh, y'all got quiet right there. <laughs> he, he's saying you're right, but you got to understand, I'm not using them because of them. I'm using them because of me. Okay, y'all still, y'all, y'all, it got, see, see, you got to understand. See, that's why, that's why you got to sit down with your narcissistic self. You got to sit down because it has nothing to do with you. It is not because we've been good. Come here, somebody. It is not because we've been righteous. It is not because we get it right. It is not because we are perfect. Oh, but it is because of the light of Christ, the mercy of Christ, the grace of Christ, that we are usable by God. That's why when God gets ready to use you, he don't check your resume. When God gets ready to use you, he don't run a background check. Because he's going to turn around and give you a gift that's going to cause you to be able to do, Lord, help me, what you can't do by yourself. God, God is not trusting you to do right by yourself. That's why Jesus said, when I leave here, I'm going to send you some help. I'm going to send you a paraclete. I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost. So the stuff you can't get right, Lord Jesus, he going to make sure you get it right. Not because you want to get it right. Come on, somebody. Not because you want to get it right. But he's going to get it. That's why 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says something like this. Be sober-minded. Yeah, be watchful. Here, here it is. Here's the assignment. Y'all got to read the Bible. Here's the assignment, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Here's the assignment. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You got a demon assigned to you. Oh, y'all not hear what I'm saying. Who's prowling around your house. He's prowling around your life like a roaring lion. Not a real lion, a roaring lion. Seeking whom he can devour. He's looking for an entry. He, he, he's looking for an entry into your life. Once he taps into your vulnerability, he makes sure that you end up in situations. Lord, have mercy. Where your vulnerability exposes you. See, because here's what you got to understand. Let me, let me tell you something about, let me tell you something about gossip. Y'all don't know nothing about gossip, but let me tell you something about, let me tell you something. When somebody puts a rumor out on you, the rumor don't work unless you know and hear about the rumor. Okay, now y'all sitting there looking at me. So, so when, a person, when a person says you this, it don't affect you until you hear about it. So now what the devil has to do is he has to, Lord Jesus, find somebody who's vulnerable enough for him to get into to make sure that the message gets back to you. So once the message gets back to you, then it starts to impact you because you can't, I'm not impacted by what I don't know. Y'all ain't saying nothing. If I don't know it, I'm not impacted by it. So what the devil has to do is find somebody who either knowingly or unknowingly, come on somebody, that he can use to make sure that a thing gets back to you so that it can impact you. Now here you are walking around mad and with an attitude and the devil sitting in the corner 
saying, there it is, right there. Yep, yep, accomplish my purpose. Accomplish my purpose. So he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, is going like a roaring lion, seeking whom may be devoured. Now, we'll go to the next slide here. The seventh, now why is that important to the lesson? Let me tell you why this is important to the lesson, and then we'll get to the end of this, because this is kind of just the foundation. The seven churches that we're going to focus on over the next few weeks, watch this, depict particular spirits that operate in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the seven churches that we're going to talk about focuses on particular spirits that operate in them. There are specific demonic strongholds found in each one of these churches. And there are some remedies to handle those strongholds given to some of these churches. So we're going to look at, we got seven churches. We're going to look at seven spirits. Y'all with me? Seven churches, seven spirits. And in each one of these, and, 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 and for each one of these churches, one of these spirits live. You, you, you have the spirit of religion, the spirit of intimidation, the spirit of compromise, the spirit of control, which we refer to as the Jezebel spirit, the spirit of traditionalism, the spirit of inferiority, and the spirit of pride. So in each one of these seven churches, you have seven spirits that are operating. And there they are on the screen for you. Religion, intimidation, compromise, control, or the spirit of Jezebel, traditionalism, inferiority, and pride. Now, as we go through the lesson, you're going to find out that there are some other smaller spirits that are encapsulated within these seven that we're going to discuss. It's going to be important that you keep in mind the distinction, watch this, between the spirit of a person, who they are, and the spirit of a thing which focuses on the intention, the motive, why a thing is done. Now, I want to remind us that it's important to understand this, uh, to understand that this is not to cause us to be walking around church trying to figure out what spirit operating. <laughs> I, I, I got to say that. I, I, I got to say that. Because you, know you know we have some spiritual police around, okay? So th th this, is not, this is not to cause us to be suspicious of one another because the truth is none of us are each other's enemy. Amen. Oh, I said something and we ain't. Hearing what I'm saying, because that's not what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says what? For we wrestle not, come on somebody, against flesh and blood, but against what? Rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And so what we've got to understand is we've got to learn how to rebuke the devil in somebody but still love them okay all right all right all right this ain't going well already I see I, I, I see because because what we can't do is we have a difficulty separating the actions of a person from the person Come on, somebody. I keep trying to tell y'all, and y'all don't listen to me, but I keep trying to tell y'all, people don't wake up and be like they are. I'm trying, they don't. People are not mean for no reason. I mean, people are not bitter and nasty for no reason. There's, there's, there's a cause to that. Come on, there's a cause to that. And that cause is that spirit. Yeah, that, that cause is that spirit. Do you not realize that every time Jesus cast a demon out of somebody? You, you remember the, the Gadarean demoniac? Oh, Lord. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When, when Jesus gets off the boat and he comes and the Gadarean demoniac meets him, 
and he asked him, why have you come to terrorize me? Come on, and the Bible says Jesus wants him to identify who he is, and he says, my name is Legion, because there's a whole lot of stuff. Come on, in me? And then Jesus ends up casting, watch this, Jesus ends up casting the spirit out, and the Bible says the man, watch this, goes to being in his right mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the old church say he was clothed in his right mind. The Bible don't say that. But it, it, it says he was in his right mind. Okay? So that guess what? When the demon exited, the person, the person became tolerable. Okay, y'all ain't, y'all ain't, Y'all, 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 y'all hear what I'm saying? See, some people just got, some people just got a bad spirit. Mm. All right. I know y'all looking at me because y'all like to jump the person instead of rebuking the devil in them. Can you imagine how much better we would be if we would stop hating each other? and understanding that some people just have bad spirit operating in them that causes them to be like they are? Yeah. Yeah. See, see, our our wrestling is not against flesh and blood. I'm done, y'all. But it's against these rulers, these cosmic powers, these things, you know. And I'm going to continue to repeat this um, because I need us to keep the real enemy yeah, from perverting the purpose of this series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see, this is not about exposing somebody. This is about exposing a demon. I ain't got nobody to help me right there. Yeah, and, and, and if we learn, see, that's why, that's, why, that's why we have to learn how to pray for each other. Come on, y'all. That's why we got to learn how to pray. I know you don't want to pray for them, but you got to pray for each. You got to pray for people. Y'all, y'all want to be honest. I'm, Wednesday night is my honest group. Y'all got to be honest. We, we, come on, y'all. We, gotta, we don't want to pray for them. We don't want to like them. And when the Holy Ghost even tried to make us like them, we like, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No, no, no. But what the Holy Spirit is really trying to get you to do is he's trying to pray, get you to pray for and bind and rebuke that thing that's operating in the person. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my, I'm going to say this every time because I don't want you to leave here like, whoa, he, Bishop over there exposing people. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But I am uncovering some demonic activity. And, and that becomes the demise of a congregation. It's the stuff that's operating that you can't see with your natural eye. That thing just needs to have a host. Okay, y'all, now hear what I'm saying? I'm done, y'all. That thing just needs to have a host. It needs to attach itself to something because those of you who study demonology, you know a, a, a demon can operate without a body. Okay, all right, all right, I'm, I'm, all right, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I'm done, I'm gonna stop right there, stop right there. Questions, you got, you got two minutes, if you, if you got one. I said I was gonna do better this time. I'm, I'm messing up already. I got two minutes, come on. I'll take, let me, let me hear one of them, it depends on how long it takes me to answer that one. All right. It says, please talk a little more about how the who directly influences the why. Who directly influences the why? Well, we just kind of talked about that a little bit because remember, uh, the Bible says what? That Satan goes up and down the land. I think that's the King James Version. Seeking Mm -hmm. whom he may devour. So what he's doing is he's just trying to find an entry point. Right. And so what, what what, what he does is he attaches himself to a person's weakness. Am I making sense? Right. See, see, say for instance, a person who has low self-esteem, right. then that demon attaches himself to that low self-esteem that causes that person to act in a way mm-hmm. 
And so that speaks to that low self-esteem. See, there, there, there's some things that you will not do right. uh, when you hold yourself uh, in, in, in a higher place of accountability. Mm -hmm. you, you follow what I'm saying? Right, right. There's some things you won't do. But see, people with low self-esteem are dangerous people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, y'all not hear what I'm saying? Right. Be because it's easier to manipulate them. Right, right. To do stuff. Right. They, they're easily uh, uh, manipulated mm -hmm. because they have low self-esteem. And, and they're looking for acceptability yeah. and Somewhere. affirmation mm -hmm. from anywhere. Right, right. They right. can get it. And that, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that because they, they, they're looking for love and all the, come on, y'all. Wrong place. There you go. They, they, there you go. Yeah, so that, that's, that's dangerous. So it is the spirit that searches out our vulnerability, our weakness, and then it attaches purpose to that weakness, which ultimately causes us to knowingly or unknowingly become the host mm. and act on behalf of the enemy. Right. Okay? You want the other one? Yeah, give me the other one. <laughs> As we enter this series... Can you speak on why so many of us were taught to fear the book of Revelations? Uh, that's, that's an easy question. That's it, because the, the, the book of Revelations, uh, now, and I will say this, it, it ought not be uh, scary to save people. Right, 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 right. Amen. Right. Oh, okay. Because we know how we're going to end. Right, right. The people that ought to be afraid. The unsaved. Oh, okay, right. so, but but what most people don't understand about the Book of Revelations is it's 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 a it's the New Testament book of prophecy, and what most people don't understand is about sixty to seventy five percent of revelations is already a revelation has already happened, happened. Mm -hmm. because it was about Rome. Mm -hmm. right. You only have another twenty five percent of it that's yet to come. Mm -hmm. You, you know what I'm saying? Right. You only have about that much that's yet to come. Most of it has already been fulfilled. And so there's, reason, there, there's, really, there's really no reason to, to, to be scared of it mm -hmm. because when you read through the book of Revelations, you know how the devil going to end. Right. Right. Somebody ought to be shouting yeah. about the fact, Lord Jesus, somebody ought to be shouting about the fact that the devil got an expiration date. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, 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 that he ain't going to last forever. Right. Come on, somebody. So, so, you know, I think the fear is the imagery. There's right. a lot of metaphors. Right. Uh, uh, there's a lot of creatures and all of this kind of stuff. And, and sometimes that imagery kind of messes with people's mind. But you have to remember, all of that points to something. It's, yeah. it's a symbol for something. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you get past uh, the gruesomeness of the, of the actual um, depiction itself, and you really start to understand what some of the metaphors are, then it's, it's, not a, it's not as frightening of a book that people think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not as frightening as people think it is. Okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you all. We're going to pray, and then we're going to pick back up and start to deal with uh, some of these spirits. Yeah, we're going to start to deal with some of, these, some of these spirits. All right? Let's pray real quickly. Father, we thank you. For this day, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. God, we, we, we believe all the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we believe it. We know it to be true, and we receive it as the word of God. And Lord, we know that contained in the Bible is life for the believer. And so, God, as we begin to study even this passage, we do it with the purpose of ensuring that our lives are aligned with your will. We do it with every intention of looking at ourselves and saying, search me, O oh God. And if you find anything in me that shouldn't be, take it out. Cleanse me. Because I want to be right. I want to be saved. I want to be whole. So help us as we go through this lesson to not focus on other people, but to focus on ourself, to make sure that we're not being used as a host. 
So we ask you to do that for us. Now, bless us and keep us until the time comes for us to come back together again. And for that, we'll give you praise, honor, and glory. And thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. The people of God say it. Amen. 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 All right. All right. Mm-hmm.